so yeah, I was asked to give this talk because of many conversations that me and my comrades had regarding the questions of revolutionary organizing and the time that we live in and experience at the moment and the role of reformism, how we relate to it. And also, you know, there's a kind of resurgence of the ideas of the Second International at the moment and also of one of, his, of its chief theoreticians, Karl Kautsky. Um, we think that it's important to talk about this, or I think it's important to talk about it because you know, we always start this, like for years now, there's a renewed interest in socialist politics. You know, more people are uh, kind of like looking into Marxism and socialism and like trying to find alternatives to capitalism again. Um, and we see the kind of movements come and go and go through different circle or cycles of interest uh, since the collapse of the Eastern Bloc in particular. You know, there was kind of like autonomism in the like 90s, the anti-political Occupy movement around the 2010 um, crisis, the left populist project that kind of came out of this, like Podemos and Seriza in uh, Spain and Greece. Um, there's also the last couple of years, maybe there were more of these like traditional social democrats like Corbyn and Sanders, to some extent Sanders maybe, um, kind of growing in size <coughs> and popularity, but also many of these projects did not really bring in the success that people had hoped or the enthusiasm that people had for them, right? Um, so in the United States, the, the DSA, Democratic Socialist Organization, grew in size, um, but you know they have their own kind of theoretical weaknesses and struggles and have to like figure out what to do now after, after kind of repeated defeats. Um, and yeah, so as Marxists, I think movements for change always excite us, but um, these experiences show ever more clearly that the question of revolutionary organizing of direction, of theoretical underpinnings of this direction, um, is, is these are not irrelevant questions, but they need to be like dealt with and discussed. Um, so I think what a lot of these projects that I've mentioned have in common is a sometimes desperate kind of clinging uh, to the hope that with the bourgeois parliamentary democracy, we can still somehow have managed well kind of in-state socialism or kind of represent can represent represent a road to socialism. I remember, for example, when I just joined the organization and I think it was, well, the meeting must have been in 2019, we had we had a talk about kind of revolution and what that means and honing in, and I was really excited for it. And all of the, like, there were lots of, like, great people that joined, but all we did was talk about, like, yeah, should we vote for Grün Links or maybe the SP after all? <laughs> or, but there's now, you know, Bayern is coming up and this is like, this will represent, like, change. And, like, I was just kind of like, hey, that was not the point of this talk. Why are we so focused on parliament when the entire point of this talk should be to, like, actually talk about what's beyond this, you know, what, what's beyond the abyss of parliament. Um, and, yeah, I think that's like a kind of a treacherous assumption that we, like, all get locked in from the way that we're raised and um, from what we know to be, like, the norm, right? that uh, political change doesn't lie with the masses, but it lies with the kind of like the ballot box that every four years you can kind of do that. And I mean, to be fair, like the, the kind of classical social democrats don't necessarily see that as the only thing to do, um, but that with these kind of movements um, in, in parliament, you can, with these parties in parliament, you can like support movements, etc. And as Marxist revolutionaries, we're also not against parties being in parliament but we don't see it as a road to change at all, right? It can be, it's more of a kind of um, an arena for political discussion or for, for propaganda. Um, I think the purpose of this talk is to give a bit of an overview of the history and the legacy of the Second International, its successes, as well as some of the estimations for its dramatic downfall. I hope that with this introduction, I can give space for discussion that uses um, the kind of historical perspectives that I've introduced you to and the understand and the and the understanding that you already have uh, for like a Marxist debate, um, and more important for revolutionary strategy to talk about revolutionary strategy in the now. By no means am I attempting to like give a complete history of the developments of the Second International and, and all of its prominent actors. It's absolutely impossible in half an hour, I think. Um, so just so you know. But the discussion is the most important part of this. Um, let's start with a broad introduction. Um, I'm not actually sure how many people are really like know much about the history of the internationals, like the international socialist organizations. I think there's probably very mixed um, levels of education about this here, so I thought maybe it's good to just start with that. So socialism, as we all know, is an internationalist movement, meaning that projects for any kind of a national socialism are undesired and, you know, in reality, impossible. The working class has no country. It's an international force that operates under the same fundamental structures and of exploitation all ac across all continents. Marx and Engels famously ended their manifesto for the Communist Party with the words proletarians of all countries unite. Um, the internationals were supposed to be the organs of coordination, exchange, and cooperation of the international working class or proletarian movement. 
So it was the first international, which was founded in 1864, known as the International Working Men's Association, which was a broad network of unions, anarchist groups, kind of early socialists, early Marxists, Proudhonists, etc. Um, the scientific methods of, of the analysis of socialism were not really, like they were in baby shoes, um, and there was a lot of kind of plurality in the organization, probably more than for its own good. So it collapsed, very short form, but it collapsed out of a conflict between anarchists and Marxists based on the lessons or the questions of the lessons of the Paris Commune. The second international was supposed to be the Socialist International. It was characterized by the development of scientific socialism and had its, in, at its heyday was seen as, an, as a seemingly unstoppable red tide. Um, but it was also like deeply scarred by its reformist and parliamentary perspectives and its dramatic collapse into supporting the First World War. There's also a third and fourth international and some people are fighting for a fifth. I don't think we have time to go into that too much. That's a whole meeting for itself. Maybe briefly, the, the Third International was founded um, to universalize and apply the lessons of the Bolshevik Revolution in 1917 and was later dissolved by Stalin as concessions to the Allied powers. Um, but let's look at the Second International closer because that's the topic of this, um, of this talk. So the Second International was founded in 1889. Um, and collapsed in 1916. It was founded on the anniversary of Bastille Day in France under a massive red banner with the words, working men of all countries unite on it. Paul Lafargue, the husband of Laura Marx, who is Karl's daughter, welcomed delegates of 25 countries with the words, we gather here not under the banner of the tricolor or any national colors, we gather here under the banner of the red flag, the flag of the international proletariat. Here you are not in capitalist France and Paris of the bourgeoisie, here, in this room, you are in one of the capitals of the international proletariat of international socialism. Powerful shit, right? Um, it ruled the working class, so this institution ruled the working class, or this network of, of parties ruled the working class movements across industrialized Europe, but also internationally, like countries like Turkey, India, Japan, Argentina, Uruguay, and Chile were part of this network as well. In 1914, it had a shared membership of 10 to 12 million workers affiliated with its national organizations. Um, and there were more than 50 million sympathizers and voters, so it's a huge power in the international working class movement. Um, there were different organizations organized within it. It was also not a kind of like one big party. It was more, like I said, more like a network. Um, some of them were more like kind of reformist organi organized, sorry, oriented. Some of them were more radical. Some were unions um, or some social democratic parties. Like there, there was some, some difference between them as well based on the national circumstances that they were in. But at the peak of this, um, second initial stood the German Social Democratic Party, the SPD, um, which under the theoretical leadership of people like August Bebel and Karl Kautsky, Kautsky built a mass workers party. Um, Kautsky, who I mentioned earlier already, was one of the chief theoreticians of the German, German Social Democratic Party and the second international. His political journey was complicated, swinging between the center, the left, and the right of the party, but ultimately, he ended up being cast as a, as a renegade for his lack of opposition to the outbreak, outbreak to this, the first war, his revisionism and parliamentary focus, and his hostility towards the Russian Revolution. We'll talk about him a bit more later. Um, so, but because this is kind of the strongest force uh, within the Second International, a lot of this talk will focus on the SPD, the German Social Democratic Party, and Karl Kautsky. Um, being German myself, I'm also more closely familiar with this history, so please, in the discussion, add any other kind of local context um, that you're familiar with to like enrich and broaden this discussion a bit more. Um, so founded in the 1860s, um, by the, the 1890s, the Social Democratic Party, uh, the SPD, was jumping from victory to victory, building um, an identity around being working class, and building an, a working class experience um, that like, was never really seen before. German workers could be born into a social democratic households, be in social democratic youth organizations when growing up, be in social democratic unions at their workplace, then join educational societies of the party in the afternoon, meeting in social democratic pubs, in sports clubs, in rowing, cycling, swimming, associations, like their entire life was based around kind of being a, a member of the party. Uh, when their week was over, they could shop in social democratic workers' consumption societies, and when they died, the party or the union might actually pay for their funeral cost if the family was struggling to pay. Um, the SPD at this time was known in the eyes of its enemies as an unstoppable red tide, uh, Umsturzpartei, like a party of overthrow, and they had a vision of a future state that motivated 
its struggle um, day in and day out. At the same time, the like the politics of the Second National and the SPD in particular represented a major failure and betrayal, most significantly with their almost unanimous support of the First World War. Um, so considering this immense strength, this massive level of activity and huge impact on the lives of tens of millions of workers, what turned this movement into what Rosa Luxemburg after the beginning of the World War called nothing but a stinking corpse. Um, you know, also note like, again, towards the, like, plurality of this party as well, this was also the movement of Kali Pnecht, Rosa Luxemburg, people like Lenin and Trotsky. There were massive ideological disputes. This was not just kind of one big thing. Um, but for the sake of the talk, I have to simplify things a little bit. Um, so the, the reasons for, its, for the degeneration and collapse of this project are not straightforward to summarize. Um, and even if I talk about some people as main culprits today, they represented larger tendencies and did not act alone. Um, the issues were theoretical in nature that reflected on organizational structure and relationship to the masses. So let's look at some of these issues. For one, um, organizationally, many of the parties of the Second International had no clear idea of building independent and revolutionary class consciousness, or rather class confidence, meaning that, um, so rather than focusing on Marx's assertion that the emancipation of the working class must be the act of the working class itself, parties like the SPD saw the working class more as a vehicle needing to be steered by enlightened and educated theoreticians and politicians. In their mind, the desires of the working class needed to be managed and with a steady and strong hap hand kept in a straight upward line for growth. There was some disagreement about um, if, if you know, there would be a revolutionary event or not, and we can talk about that later, but there was an agreement about that the central objective was to build a mass party, ideally of the entire working class and representing the entire working class. This grew out of a mechanical understanding of dialectical materialism. Um, and the development of capitalism. So the dominant thought was that socialism was truly and absolutely inevitable. Capitalism would birth a working class that through capitalist development swells further and further and further until at some point reaching critical mass, which enables them to have parliamentary representation in a majority of seats that then can lay hold of the state machine through elections and assert their power and kind of instate socialism uh, through that way. Um, I will talk later a bit, like in, in a bit, in a couple of minutes, about uh, the theoretical basis a little bit more. But um, here it's also important to know that this kind of like thought came out of the reality that these parties organ, uh, operated in a time of relative peace, relative stability, and relative growth um, in Europe, um, and that that has definitely shaped their perspectives on this. Um, so amidst the strategy of growth, an ever larger layer of bureaucrats and paid staffers took hold of the unions and of the party bureaucracy and soon became a bastion of conservatism. This layer did not need to fight bosses for higher wages. They needed to ensure stable conditions, good faith negotiations with the bourgeoisie, and peace. Um, kind of social peace, right? Despite the party's radical rhetoric, the bureaucracy dropped revolutionary aims and mass mobilization. Spontane spontaneity of the masses was actually discouraged as it kind of could destroy the smooth and stable growth and kind of uh, lead to like backlashes of the bourgeoisie. If we look at some of the more theoretical underpinnings uh, that have motivated these developments, um, is that like previously mentioned, the Second International was holding on to a mechanical version of dialectical materialism, viewing human development as a system of rigid stages which ignore the dialectical clashing and often mixed nature of historical developments and class consciousness. Um, this grew out of the belief that socialism and Marxism are absolute like scientific theories with scientific truth, which is not entirely wrong that they are scientific theories, but the way that it was applied was in a really deterministic way. Um, so in place of dialectical materialism, we saw what Gramsci called mechanical materialism. Um, furthermore, the analysis of the class nature of the state was often watered down by actors within a second international so Marx asserted that the states arise of, out of the irreconcilability of class antagonisms, but revisionists in the Second International like Ed, Eduard Bernstein, or later also the Russian Mensheviks, claimed that it actually is able to reconcile the class antagonisms, that it manages the clashes within society and the clashes of classes, that the state is kind of like standing over this, or can stand over this if managed properly. There were more centrist actors like Kautsky who acknowledged the class nature of the state as bourgeois, um, and in some form, like I said, there was some talk about a revolutionary event, but it was never really clear 
that this revolution needed to mean the smashing of the old state machine and the building of a new worker state. For these more centrist actors of the party, they didn't rule out the chance for a political revolution, but the growth of the party was so essential um, because, because when socialism would finally kind of come or the, if the time was ripe, it needed to, um, you know, it needed to steer these developments. Another important shortcoming was that the parties like the SPD saw themselves as representatives of the full working class. Unlike a Leninist vanguard party, which seeks to unite the most class conscious, active revolutionaries of the working class, the Social Democratic Mars Party sought to represent the entire class. It furthermore viewed itself as an embryo to the, futurist, to the future socialist state. Okay, good timing. Um, to the future socialist state, uh, working class consciousness was measured by party membership. So outside of the party, there was no consciousness. And if there were a lot of members of the party, there was very high consciousness. Um, but that also doesn't really take into account like on what grounds people join this party. Like um, the Vanguard party really invests in training its members to be revolutionaries, whereas the Social Democratic or these parties did not necessarily do that. Um, revolution was seen as something that might happen, but since there's no way of determining when, how, or even if, the question of what constitutes a revolution and what to do in an event uh, was pushed aside. This represented a rightward turn um, and a kind of orientation towards first and foremost parliamentary work, which is now known as reformism um, or reformist politics. And this was first really expressed by um, uh, the theoretician Eduard Bernstein in the late 1890s. Bernstein argued that the party should move away openly, not just in practice as it was already doing, but now openly and also in theory from revolutionary socialism to evolutionary socialism. He viewed the state, like I said, as standing above classes and asserted that the final goal, no matter what it is, is nothing and the movement is everything. Interestingly, one of his opponents um, uh, was mentioned Karl Kautsky. I will turn our attention to him now and his politics since there is, like I said earlier, we're experiencing somewhat of a resurgence of Kautsky's political ideas, um, both in Netherlands and internationally. Um, Karl Kautsky was a protege of Engels and an editor of the central theoretical organ of the SPD, Die Neue Zeit, the New Times, which was regarded as, um, or he was regarded as a kind of embodiment of a supposed Marxist orthodoxy, which gave him the nickname the Pope of Marxism. Pretty cool name. Um, like I've said earlier, Kautsky moved um, kind of around the political landscape of the SPD, um, starting arguably on the left, or there were periods of radicalization, for example, after the 1905 Russian Revolution, um, but ended up undoubtedly on the right. Based on the mechanical materialism of the period, Kautsky had an iron faith in the continual growth of the working class forces and its consciousness as long as, there no, as long as there is no provocation too harsh, too harsh, which would motivate backlash. Interestingly, Kautsky's words often has a, have a revolutionary tone to it, um, while actually undermining actual revolutionary perspectives. In his work, Road to Power, for example, he says, and here come some lengthy quotes, sorry about that, I'll do my best. Um, we know that our goal can only be attended, attained through revolution. We also know that it is just as little in our power to create this revolution as it is in our power of our opponents to prevent it. It is no part of our work to instigate a revolution or to prepare the way for it. And since the revolution cannot be arbitrarily created by us, we cannot say anything about uh, whatever, about when, under what conditions, or what forms it will come. We know that the class struggle between the bourgeoisie and the proletariat cannot, until the latter is fully in possession of political power, cannot end un unless the latter is in full possession of political power and has used it to introduce a socialist society. So this sounds very radical. There's a lot to unpack on the statement, um, but I think that there's a focus on this idea of political power, which is not economic power and is not social power. And um, there's this, this idea that, that you know, our opponents cannot prevent revolutionary change. We can't do anything to prepare for it. It's this kind of, this notion of like, well, it will happen, but we don't really know what to do about it. Um, yeah, which I, d I don't think is really like a revolutionary position to take. Um, of course, we can't start a revolution just randomly and declare it. That's also um, a trap that some leftist groups fall in. Um, but I do think that there's, there's ways in which we can prepare and intervene in working class struggles um, and the struggles of our class to, to move towards that. But we can talk more about that later. Um, 
So let's look more at what he means by political power. In the class struggle, Kautsky's elaboration on the famous Erfurt program of the SPD, he states, um, it is beginning to become apparent that a real parliamentary regime can just as well be an instrument for the dictatorship of the proletariat as an instrument for the dictatorship of the bourgeoisie. Kautsky uses words like workers' political power and revolution, but in reality, what he's speaking of is a government with a, with a working class party established by universal suffrage based on parliament in a parliamentary republic. He elaborates, through parliamentary activity, the working class must strive to influence the state authorities and bend them to its purpose. Where the bosses can influence rules and leg legislation directly, workers can do so only through parliamentary activity. By electing representatives to parliament, therefore, the working class can exercise an influence over the governmental powers. Further, he states that the revolution doesn't mean a decisive, doesn't have to mean a decisive blow, but long periods of years of economic and political struggle, and that's actually also not a, a necessarily a kind of rupture um, or a kind of a, a strong kind of like uh, explosion of power or something of the working class, but that there's also chances where that uh, the ruling class, or there's also a chance that the ruling class can be exceptionally clear-sighted or so weak and cowardly that they voluntarily abdicate. I mean, this is, we always say that, you know, we're, we, we, we hope that, that the revolution can be a really peaceful process, but I think this is kind of given an indication on the, on the, like, on this, this, this idea of, like, really not discussing what a revolution would mean and where it's likely headed. Um, Kautsky argued against Bernstein, so these, uh, these revisionists giving lip service to revolution, but in reality um, he was more concerned with unity and stability um, because two harsh arguments could least lead to splits, which at all costs had to be avoided because if the party is the class, if there's a split in the party, there's a split in the class. Um, and this is also something that uh, radicals like um, Luxembourg, for example, like one of the reasons why, why there was no, no kind of splitting off of these radicals from the party and also why people, people like Trotsky stayed um, with the kind of reformist currents because there was this high focus on unity. Um, which is also interesting because this idea of left unity today is still kind of there, you know, that like we can just kind of look past all of our differences and past all of our different like traditions and ideas about revolution as long as we're kind of all together in one body, if we just kind of like fuse Green links in the PVDR or something like this, kind of we're like in a in a good 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 place. Not that either of them are revolutionary, but you know. Um, so parliamentarism for Kautsky represented a two-pronged strategy. Neither provoke the enemy through mass action nor collaborate with them in government. But he did not grasp the importance of unexpected explosions of mass activity that teach the working class lessons beyond parliament. So, you know, he was saying things like that the proletariat has no reason to mistrust parliamentary action. Luxembourg, on the other side of this debate, asserted that the working class leaps, like has these like leaps of consciousness and moments where it finds itself in struggle. That spontaneity of the of the of the masses and of the class should be supported by socialists with political leadership, and that the possibility of revolution revolutionary rupture should be placed on the agenda, um, and that that leaders of the socialist movement should be leaders not for the working class but of the working class and in of itself. Um, so we kind of see that theory matters because these, these zigzags um, of kind of theoretical understanding of what revolution means and what revolutionary strategy is had impacts on the, on the policies of how to build a revolutionary party. Um, we, we see this, for example, also when it really comes to like supporting strikes and mass action. There were periods of uh, uh, uprisings in, in Prussia in 1910 where the left uh, called for mass strikes, but Kautsky is kind of like, you know, our main objective, I quote, the objective of our political struggle remains the conquest of state power through the conquest of a majority in parliament and the elevation of parliament to a commanding position in the state, not the destruction of state power. Similarly, a couple of years later, Luxembourg and the revolutionary left called for mass offensive struggles for democratic republic, but Kautsky was kind of like, we have to keep the gunpowder dry having in mind the 1912, so the 1912 Reichstag elections. Um, so what we see here is that in practice, Kautsky gave a lot of theoretical cover for those in the party who anxiously watched movements from below grow um, and you know, who wanted to put uh, the party and the working class back on the good kind of safe road to, to reforms and union routines. 
Um, and I think at large, this kind of set of politics represents this like hope that you can overturn capitalism somehow without having decisive ruptures with the capitalist system. Um, there's two more points. I think we still have some good time, right? Yeah. Um, should be fine. So one of the things that I still want to talk about is the question of war. Um, and I think this has a renewed um, urgency at the moment, obviously. Um, because the second international, like I said, um, collapsed into supporting, like after supporting the first world war, even though previously the second international uh, issued resolutions positioning itself firmly as the anti-war party. In the case of war, all socialists should mobilize and act decisively to bring it to a swift stop. So an important position of the socialist international was that every country had, to, had a right to defend itself and no country had a right to attack another uh, so they made a distinction between offensive and defensive war. And this was like a main criterion on, on like if they should support a war or if they should, like, if they should act against it. Um, so the thing is though that in the stage of imperialist, like of um, imperialism, the capitalist stage of imperialism, the, like, the question of how to determine if there is an offensive war, or defensive war becomes increasingly more problematic, as we also see now. I don't know how many were you in the, of you were in the talk earlier about Ukraine. Um, and I think the lines are not as like, you know, clear cut anymore. Um, and this is exactly what, what happened in the, in the case of the First World War, where none of the parties were able to really determine whether what they were facing now is a defensive war of their own country or an offensive war of, of, of their country, right, of their imperialist nation. Um, Rosa Luxemburg propagated the position that in, in the case of inter-imperialist wars, revolutionary socialists should reject any alignment with uh, one imperialist nation or another and form a third camp that of the working class um, and turn the, the national war efforts into a revolutionary war. Unfortunately, like I said, none of this, none of this kind of more radical approach um, mattered and um, the party was unable to really find a decision. So. Um, in 1914, as Germany geared up for war, both the unions and then later the um, SPD de de delegates voted almost unanimously for war, shocking the international left um, among Lenin and Luxembourg and Liebknecht, um, because they like recognized that the, this vote this vote meant like an end to the like a, it was a death blow to the Second International and its principles. Um, and all I think like the vast majority of international um, of, of members, member organization of the Second International joined the war efforts, with the exception of, for example, the Russian Bolsheviks. Um, I think the Socialist Party of America and, and some Italian groups as well didn't. Um, I think there's some others, uh, but yeah, the vast majority supported the war. Um, and I think this is also important to say quickly that like, I was in discussion at some point where somebody just said, oh, well, you know, all of the workers wanted the war and they were just really enthusiastic about it. And I mean, I'm sure that there was some enthusiasm about it because they were blinded and misled by the working class. And they were also blinded and misled by their leadership. And this kind of comes out of reality of having such a big uh, discrepancy between the leadership of a political party and its actual base and the people it claims to represent. Because if all of a sudden leaders that you've put all of your trust in over years unanimously agree that now this war is the right war and we need to support it and send you off to it, well, you can imagine that uh, it's difficult to, to really build resistance to it from, from the bottom down if that was never encouraged before. Okay, coming to an end. Um, <laughs> so the legacy of the Second National leaves us many lessons and perspectives. So I think we have a lot to discuss in the coming hour. Um, I think personally for me, one of the most important takeaways is that the strategy of a mass party with an electoral focus is a dead end and uh, under the conditions that we operate in currently. The reality is that under capitalism, different layers of the working class are like have different levels of radicalization and consciousness. Um, we don't live in a revolutionary situation yet, so we have to figure out how to operate as revolutionaries. And I don't think that joining an electoral party is the right strategy. As revolutionaries, our main objective should be to be visible and to argue for revolutionary perspectives on an independent basis um, in our own working class organization and in working class movements as part of the working class. Um, that means we participate in movements for, for, for reform, but we always push further um, in the hope that, or, well, we always push further with a kind of revolutionary perspective. Um, I think, well, there's some, some more things I was going to say, but I think I'll skip ahead a little bit. 
Um, I think it's important, like, that's something that we're, we're lacking in the Netherlands. There's, you know, there's no, no new electoral initiative can, can make up for the weakness of the left at the moment, and no fusion between revolutionaries and reformists, and no fusion between two neoliberal self-identified left parties can do that either. Um, building a revolutionary party or rev revolutionary workers' party can only happen in periods of struggle, based not on parliamentary majorities, but on actions in workplaces, universities, and streets, and the self-organization of working people. Um, so if you're not a member yet, you should really consider joining a revolutionary organization. We're not a revolutionary party, but we hope that in the future we can become part of a project to build something like that and build a revolutionary left-wing and socialist alternative. Thanks.